Bon dia. Good morning. Uh, I wish you a warm welcome to the Bus to Bus Digital Roadshow today. Um, my name is Annalisa Löcke and I'm the international representative uh, for Messe Berlin in Portugal, working for the German Portuguese Chamber of Commerce. Um, we as the Chamber of Commerce have a headquarters in Lisbon and a branch office in Porto and with over a thousand members we are the biggest bilateral Chamber of Commerce in uh, Portugal. So today, um, with our panel of international experts, uh, we will discuss the topic uh, advancing sustainable bus mobility on the Iberian Peninsula. And um, yeah, a big thank you to our panelists for accepting uh, our invitation. Um, I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion and getting to know insights um, about the bus industry and what is happening in uh, Portugal and, and Spain. Um, I will just say a few words in Portuguese um, for our Portuguese participants and then hand over to my colleague uh, in Spain. So, um, aos participantes portugueses, uh, quero agradecer uh, por participar nesta iniciativa e uh, também apelo à vossa, um, vossa participação através de questões uh, no chat. Uh, espero que este evento corresponda às vossas uh, expectativas uh, e que vos traga uh, muitas informações úteis sobre o futuro da indústria dos transportes rodoviários de passageiros. Obrigada. Thank you. And uh, Zylvia, the stage is yours. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I'm Silvia De Juanes, official representative of uh, Mercy Berlin for over um, now our office for over 30 years. And we have been in Bus to Bus from the very beginning, a very interesting project. And I'm really happy today to be here and to be able to, to know more about the insights of uh, this, uh, this sector, which I think in Spain it's very important, in Portugal is very important, and it's gaining momentum um, since, since uh, many years. So I'm going to be very short because uh, I think uh, now you are the stars. <laughs> and uh, I will hand over to my colleague Willow from Germany. Thanks, Annalisa and Sylvia, and um, welcome to another edition of our Bus to Bus Digital Roadshow uh, today on the Iberian Peninsula. Um, I'm just going to start off uh, by saying a few words about our event Bus to Bus that's happening in Berlin, for those of you who are not familiar with our event. And um, 2017 is when Bus to Bus premiered, and it's been a really, really big pleasure from our side, the Bus to Bus team, to watch it grow and gain popularity over the last couple of years. So... Bus to Bus is a mobility trade show and business platform for the German and European bus industry, and it will take place now for the fourth time next year, the end of April 2024. And it's a mobility trade show and a business platform, and um, yeah, it really attracts uh, exhibitors, international exhibitors and visitors um, from all sorts of sectors, from uh, the uh, urban and mobility um, sector from private bus tourism as um, bus tourism and private sector, as well as long distance transport. So really something for everybody here. And uh, at the moment, we are currently offering our early bird prices for exhibitors. So if you are interested, please get in touch soon as booking space is um, being taken up quite quickly. Um, other than that, yes, we'd like to uh, get this discussion started. We're looking really forward to this event. Um, we have some great mobility experts with us today. And uh, my appeal to everybody watching today, please use the opportunity to um, put in your questions into the live stream area underneath. Um, we will answer the questions uh, today as we go along. So feel free to inter interact and we hope you have a great time. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our moderator, Diogo Nunes, and he will introduce the rest of the panelists. But uh, thank you very much for being here today. We look forward to having you. And um, yes, I would like to perhaps uh, ask you as a journalist at the digital media outlet ECO um, to start things off. Maybe we can ask you a question. What, what do you feel is uh, your vision of sustainable mobility? Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you for watching uh, remotely this uh, discussion. So we will start uh, with these four speakers we have in our session today. We have uh, Rulen Tro Trohaola, a Dash uh, market sales manager from Irizar Immobility. 
We have Tiago Sá, Sales Director from Caetano Bus. Felipe de Oliveira Fernandes, Sales Manager of OmniFlow. And Jaime Rodriguez Medal, Director of Confebus, the Spanish Confederation of Buses. Uh, it's interesting that we have a variety of um, parts of uh, shapes in the, in the bus uh, ecosystem, ecosystem because we have two manufacturers. We have um, a, tech, a, tech no, a tech company which is developing new solutions for this industry. And then we have the association which, which unites all the companies working on this environment. So it's the, it is it is with this with this with this, with this context that we will start with the um, the first question. So I will start with Tiaxa from Kitten Bus to ask to ask him uh, how is Kitten positioning itself in regard to new drives? What are the strategies for electric and hydrogen technologies? And as well, which partnerships they have right now to speed up their their business? Okay, thank you, Diogo. Good morning, everyone. Um, so Keitano is has already developed and start to build a path to zero emission buses uh, quite a long time ago. So in 2019, we decided as a, um, a manufacturer that we will no longer produce uh, new vehicles in combust with combustion engine, although we do body build some some steel some buses for the coach market and airport market that there are still very used in the combustion engines. We are, we are still producing buses uh, that um, are, are have combustion engine. But for the cities, uh, city buses, we no longer produce um, uh, buses uh, with combustion engines. We only produce uh, electrical and hydrogen vehicles. Uh, at the moment, we have a 12 meter uh, and 10.7 vehicles for electrical mo uh, mobility and hydrogen mobility. Um, in 2021, we have we formed a partnership with Toyota. Um, I think it's well known to everyone. And we, in Europe, um, we are the only uh, bodybuilders and bus builders with uh, with the Toyota FC stack. Um, this allow us and this joint venture with Toyota allow us to, to have um, a sustainable and let's say tested uh, hydrogen vehicle uh, that allow us to have also the support from Toyota from, from several points of um, after sales and maintenance. Uh, and in the future, uh, we want to escalate our, our service to 18 meters uh fc coach of course and of and uh, the airport business so we will have uh we'll have the first uh fc uh, uh, hydrogen vehicle for the um, the airports operating the airports um and also um the fc coach it's in our roadmap so at the moment we are we are we have already two types of buses of hydrogen and we have a, a wider uh, range of solutions in terms of hydrogen vehicles, uh, we are also working in the other other side of the business, which is the EMS, which is electrical mobility as a service. Uh, so what we want to do with this this product is to um, help the operators do the, the transition from combustion engine vehicles to electrical and hydrogen vehicles. So uh, since it is uh, recently a new technology. And uh, in terms of operation, uh, time management, depot management, it's different because with the diesel diesel bus, you can just uh, arrive to the depot um, and then go to the gas station, uh, fill up the, the 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 gas tank, and then you park the vehicle. With electrical vehicles, for example, you need to have one specific spot, uh, one specific charger. If it's not double double hoses or or pentagraph, but you. you, you have to have a different layout from diesel buses. Um, and what we want to do with this electrical mobility as a system, as a service, it's to provide a smooth transition for the operators to go fully electrical and hydrogen technology. So they won't have so much impact in, the, in their daily operation. Uh, let's say training also the, the, the buses, the drivers, um, that have a huge impact on, on, on the, the, the way they operate the bus um, because they have a huge impact on also on consumptions. And 
as as a, let's say as a, a manufacturer bus manufacturer we are already let's say uh, target to zero emission uh, products yeah where can we see your electric and hydrogen buses right now so um our main market it's it's in europe so let's say germany and france uh, at the moment uh, italy is starting to growing but uh, germany and it's the biggest let's say market uh, that has huge tenders, big tenders, and public fundings for hydrogen and electrical vehicles. Uh, this is where our, let's say, footprint, biggest footprint, it's in um, in Germany. But we have also in Australia, we have uh, in Saudi Arabia, um, in terms of zero emission buses for FC. And if you go to the airport, I would say we are all, all, all around the world. We have in Canada um united states so uh, and goes on the list goes on so in, in terms but of it airports, has another name right the brand is yeah, different it's cobus it's cobus it's Cobos, uh, uh yeah they it's they they are sold it by the brand of cobus but they are manufactured here in portugal in gaia um by ketano bus okay tiago thank you very much we'll be right we'll be back to you uh jaime rodriguez medal um, I would like to ask you uh, which factors are most important to your association members when they are deciding whether to add electric buses to their fleet, because there are many questions around this point. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Diego, for the, for the introduction. Um, big thanks to the organizers for organizing this digital roadshow and for the opportunity to to, to be here to, to talk about, uh, about some challenges in this uh, interesting topic. Um, quick introduction, Confebus is the, is the trade association representing Spanish private bus and coach companies, uh, providing all type of bus and coach related services and all, all type of, of uh, uh, sizes of companies, uh, big, small, uh, medium sized. Uh, in fact, uh, we do have in Spain 2,800 undertakings in, in the bus and coach sector. And the average uh, company has uh, around 15 vehicles, which is not, uh, as you can imagine, is not a, a large uh, fleet. But uh, just just to, to bring the question that this is a, a very small and medium-sized enterprise uh, industry. Um, regarding your question, obviously there are several factors to consider when when including electrical vehicles to the to the fleets. Obviously, the cost of the vehicle is, is, is one of them. Uh, the subsidies that you can get in order to, to, to purchase that, uh, that vehicle, um, the infrastructure to, to recharge, the power of supply, um, cost of maintenance, charging time, weights, batteries. There are several factors. From the point of view of, um, of the operators, we have to consider that right now, uh, electric buses are only being deployed effectively in public urban transport services and because of the mainly to the to the autonomy of the of the batteries and, and, and other key factors so in this particular aspect something which is always forgotten but it is important from the point of view of operators is the length of the public service contract we have to consider that the that the current legislation only allows for this public service contract to last for a maximum of 10 years uh, obviously, when the regulation was done, uh, nobody was thinking about uh, alternative fuel vehicles or other type of vehicles different from, from, from uh, conventional propulsion uh, fuel ones. Uh, and obviously, this affects also when considering buying uh, electric vehicles, because normally uh, these, these new vehicles have always a higher cost. We are talking about that two, three times uh, more money than the than the conventional fuel uh, bus. And uh, if the maximum length of the contract is, is the same, obviously you require a larger amount of time to amortize, amortize the, the price of the vehicle. You have to consider it's not only buying the vehicle, it's it's also adapting the the, the facilities of the of the company, training, training drivers, training uh, the people in the facilities to, to work with that uh, with that uh, vehicle, the mechanicians that in the end will become and electric. Jaime, yes. should it be shorter or longer, the contract? Longer, longer in otherwise. In your opinion. It should be longer, otherwise it's impossible to amortize the, the, the vehicle. 
in this type uh, of longer thing. like what 15 years 20 years 30 uh, years uh, because the batteries have uh, uh, a life right and usually the guarantee for the batteries nowadays is like six eight years and the technology is constantly um it has a lot of evolutions that's why um i'm asking this but you have to consider that when you are performing this type of public service contracts uh, it's not that you buy one vehicle and that vehicle lasts the whole uh, life of the vehicle you need also to maintain certain um age of the fleet when performing this type of services. So normally you will need more time in order to amortize all the vehicles that you're going to need uh, through the, all the duration of the contract. So obviously you need you need longer time. Perhaps we are talking yeah, 15 or even more, more years. Okay, okay. And uh, which, um, besides your concern about time of, um, of the contracts, uh, I would like to ask you, um, which kind of mechanisms or regulations or funding schemes you have to support this transition in Spain? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, we have regulation that obliges, in, in the case of um, urban transport, uh, for Spain to have a specific threshold of uh, heavy-duty vehicles used in public transport uh, that have to be um, alternative fuel, and half of them have to be zero emissions, which is obviously the, the, the electric bus. From 2021 until 2025, 45 of the, of the fleets in new public service contracts have to be alternative fuel uh, buses, but vehicles, because it, it covers more, more than, than, than buses. Um, and half of them, around 23%, yeah, have to be zero emissions. From 2026 onwards, until 2030, it increases up to 65 percentage of uh, alternative fuel buses and half, so 30, 32, 33 percent have to be zero, zero emissions. That's a regulation that we have to comply. It's um, imposed by the by the European Union. Is the clean fuel is the clean vehicles directive. Uh, so once it's transposed, it's compulsory for all for all the member states. In the case of Spain, those are the percentage. So this is something that already obliges us to invest in a certain certain technology. There is also political support uh, in terms of economic incentives, uh, thanks mainly to the uh, European uh, Union Next Generation Funds. Uh, however, I have to say that the amount of uh, money, maximum funding that you can get access to is not enough attractive. They are offering you, um, if you're a private company, between depending on the size, between 1,000, 30,000 euros or 1,000, 80,000, 80, uh, uh, 80, 80 euros, uh, 8,000 euros. And, um, well, if you have to invest in the vehicle, uh, the energy, uh, training, the facilities, um, and so on, it's not enough attractive. In the, uh, to, to be honest, we have had to two calls of proposals, and if I am correct, we have only purchased around 1,000 vehicles, which is less than 10% of the urban bus, bus fleet. So let's say more political and economic incentives to, to, to buy, to purchase and to deploy these type of vehicles are needed, otherwise uh, it's not going to be enough. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, what is the average age of the Spanish buses right now affected to the public service? Uh, it should be around five or six years old, the average age. Five or six, okay. In, the, in these public service contracts, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. We will go back to you uh, soon. Now move forward to Rulen Trojaola. Rulen, uh, I went to um, UITP uh, event uh, last week, and Iriza was one of the companies which was exhibiting their buses. So I would like to ask you, um, which are the new developments your company has regarding the, um, the bat on uh, battery vehicles or fuel cell batteries or hydrogen um, battery uh, vehicles? Uh, can you tell the pros and the cons of one of each of these options? Hi, Diego. Good morning to everyone. 
Uh, Diego, I hope that our stand is the one that you like the most on the UATP. <laughs> I cannot pronounce about it. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Uh, well, actually, you asked um, the million dollar question, right? I mean, um, well, for sure at Irisar. Now, today I'm representing Irisar Immobility, which is the company within Irisar Group that uh, manufactures uh, battery CD buses. I mean, actually, CD buses powered by battery, and then is the rest of the Irisar Irisar Group, mainly Irisar, the headquarter that manufactures uh, class two and class three coaches, uh, diesel, biodiesel, hybrid, gas, liquid gas. I mean, the portfolio is huge. So uh, we are quite experienced with different kind of technologies in terms of powertrain in all the portfolio of the public transport. Pros and cons, uh, a lot for everyone. We can start a discussion right now. Uh, we will be done by noon, uh, midnight. So in this case, for example, a city city mobility, we only manufacture battery city buses. Why? Because we think that at this stage today, uh, 15th of June 2023, the fuel cell for city buses is not affordable enough. As uh, Jaime was saying, here, uh, most of the customers, operators, even if they are public, whether they don't have this complexity of having time-limited uh, public transport contracts, the investment that you need to do in terms of the vehicle and in terms of the of the infrastructure to to charge them is is very high. Of course, it has a lot of pros. Also, the fuel cell longer range, which could reduce the amount of the fleet in compared to electric buses. In this case. We at Irisar took this bet. We think that uh, right now in 2023, the bet should be focused on battery buses. Uh, maybe next year we change our mind. I mean, for sure we have been investing in research and development also to, to get to know the fuel cell. I mean, as uh, Tiago was saying, Caetano is now one of the leaders in terms of fuel cell and they are, I mean, cleaning the road for all of us that we are going to get uh, to the market after them. But uh, right now, as it is, uh, it is that things that for the city, the future is battery. Well, sorry, the midterm future is battery. And for the long range, it's completely the opposite. The battery has no place. Uh, could be gas, could be liquid gas. Uh, this new biomethane diesel that um, they were uh, talking in the news some time ago, could be fuel cell, I don't know, but for sure we don't think that the lithium batteries as they are today are the future. Yes, you are also involved in a project with um, Avanza in Zaragoza. Can you tell us a bit more about this project and how this connects to the future of uh, sustainable mobility? Okay, yes, this project is, uh, well, we are a lot of partners here. It's not only Avanza, it's also the city okay. of Zaragoza. Uh, three, four uh, Spanish research and development centers, Tecnalia, CITAC. Um, there is also a research and development center of Aragon that I cannot recall the name right now. I mean, the, the goal is, as you said, to make the city transport cleaner, more sustainable and safer. Uh, it has three pillars. The first one is... Um, to make it more efficient. I mean, so the operator in the end has a less expensive vehicle, both in the OPEX and in the CAPEX, because in the end, the less, I mean, could be that the, I mean, the electric vehicle is going to be more expensive today. That's a reality. But the goal is to make it less expensive in the future. And the energy that you are using it in the end makes it, makes a more attractive TCO compared to a diesel bus, which is in the end, uh, the type of vehicle we are being compared with. That's the first goal. The second goal is to be more sustainable, automotive and safe. So in the end, right now, uh, in the in the industry, we have a, a huge threat, which is the lack of drivers. So in the end, we need to push that this, uh, this job, the driver job is going to be less, and, I mean, it's going to be a higher demand. And also we need to make the environment safer for the, for the drivers, because in the end, the driver is the one that is being pushed by us, which are the, the public, the, the customers. Ah, you arrive late, you need to arrive earlier. This is not uh, too smooth, you're driving too harsh. 
they are under a lot of pressure. So one of the goals of the DG City is to sensorize the complete vehicle. So in order that the driver has less stress and the vehicle arrives more on time. How? Um, uh, traffic light priority. Also, the vehicle is uh, able to read all the different traffic signals and adapting the speed. So the vehicle is also capable of always parking at the stops at the very same distance to avoid that the people with disabilities need to start getting out of the stop up in the past, which also in the end to annoys the people with uh, disabilities in a wheelchair, uh, someone with a, tr a kid trolley, and also takes time to get the ramp in, the ramp out, and so And that takes, uh, makes the bus to arrive later to the, next, uh, to the next stop. And the fourth one goes in terms of hydrogen development. I mean, as said, we don't have a hydrogen city bus. That doesn't mean that we don't want to know what a hydrogen city bus um, is because in the future, maybe in 2025, we change our mind and say, no, the future of the city is right now in 2025 is hydrogen. So we need to know what are we facing. We don't want to wait until this day arrives. So that's the the four, the three pillars of this project. And I said, it's not only Iris and Avanza, there is an ecosystem of, of companies working, working on it. Okay, thank you, Julian. Now I'm moving to Philip de Oliveira Fernandes. Uh, I'm very curious about the presence of Omniflow in this panel because Omniflow is known for their um, infrastructure to charge, for example. Uh, I would like to understand how, what is the connection between Omniflow and the industry of bus. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Buzz the Buzz uh, for being in this great, with this great panelist uh, here at the, this uh, digital roundtable. And um, just just uh, for the beginning, uh, uh, Omniflow is uh, really um, a smart and sustainable infrastructure uh, powered by, by wind and solar and uh, providing more than 90 percent uh, of savings in on uh, energy consumption while hosting many application inside the unit uh, for um, services for smart cities like 5g computer vision air quality monitoring uh, audio alerts etc and uh, and in fact uh, omniflow uh, our core business uh, really focuses on developing and providing uh, sustainable and smart infrastructures for um, these smart city services, namely in the uh, mobility environment and um, and safety, the and safety areas. Uh, so, answering to your to your question, Omniflow uh, believes that a new and sustainable drives are uh, advancements in technology and the shift towards renewable energy services and sources. So. We think this will have a significant impact on cities, uh, and in fact, we can we can um, split uh, in uh, in five different ways uh, in which these uh, drives are directly impacting the cities. Um, the first one is uh, about electrical vehicles. Um, we think the the rise of electrical vehicles is transforming urban. Uh, transportation. So EVs offer lower emissions, reduce noise pollution, and improve uh, air 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 quality uh, compared to to conventional vehicles. And um, as more people switch to EVs, uh, cities are uh, at the same time experiencing uh, a, a decrease in air pollution and corresponding improvement in uh, public um, public charging stations, for example, which are becoming more prevalent in urban areas. So uh, the second one, it's all about sustainable public transportation. So this includes um, expansion of electric buses, not also not not also uh, electric buses, but uh, trams uh, also or trains. Uh, and all of them powered by renewable energy uh, sources. The other one is uh, bicycle, bicycle infrastructure and bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. 
Um, and these sustainable drives have led to the development of dedicated cycling lanes, for example, uh, bike sharing programs, uh, pedestrian friendly infrastructure. Um, and in fact, this reduces traffic congestion uh, and also contributes to healthier and more livable cities uh, by encouraging active, active uh, lifestyles or reducing uh, action emissions. Uh, Philippe, uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt your pitch. Uh, I would, I would like, really like to understand how yeah. your smart poles can uh, charge the electric buses because the batteries of the buses are quite bigger than uh, a battery of yeah. the current EVs. Okay, I would like to understand how many smart poles are necessary, for example, to charge uh, a bus, yeah. in this case, from Caetano, from yeah. uh, Isari Mobility. I would yeah. like to understand that. Thank you very okay. much. OK, OK. Uh, so with our platform, we uh, generate uh, by solar and wind energy in the batteries inside the unit. Um, so this uh, energy we created, we, we, we generate, is uh, in the first place for uh, for lighting, uh, okay, and then for all um, the services uh, we we already talked like 5G, Wi-Fi, um, digital signage, video analytics, etc. In this case, uh, we can add also uh, uh, an electric vehicle charger. On the on the pole on the on the on the on this smart pole, but in fact the energy goes it's uh, directly connected to the grid, not generated by our unit. The the, the main thing here, here is that we in one single infrastructure like OmniFlow we can assemble also the uh, we can assemble the also the uh, EV chargers uh, and uh, connect them to our dashboard. And so we can manage all the, the, the services um, through, our, through our dashboard, okay? So we are not able to generate energy in our units for uh, feed um, electrical vehicle, vehicles. What we do, for example, is uh, some smart bus stops, for example, which has uh, which has um, uh, a, a digital display on the on the on the on the pool, okay, and that uh, information uh, it's all about how late the bus is, uh, at what time is the next bus, or uh, we can also provide digital signage by. Uh, with the local news always passing around the, the display. So um, we are really not providing the energy directly for EV chargers, okay? Okay, okay. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, we move forward to the second, to the second panel, uh, but we cannot forget that uh, lorries, buses, and coaches are responsible for more than a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions from road transport in the European Union and for over 6% of the total EU greenhouse gas emissions. That's why European Union is taking a several actions to decrease a lot, by, but really a lot, to reach the carbon neutrality in 2050. And there are some, also some targets before to 2030. And we move forward to the second panel when we will uh, discuss a bit more about the sustainability and the new sources of energy. And I would like to, um, to ask you a general question to all of you. Um, because in the past, there, there used to be the, um, the trolleys running in the cities. In the 70s and 80s, it was quite common to cities. Even in Portugal, I assume in Spain, there was also this kind of infrastructure. So we have a question uh, from the audience, from the audience asking if there's still um, if there's still a place in the industry for in motion charging using uh, hybrid trolley buses and battery electric vehicles, particularly for routes with hills and inclines. Who wants to answer first? 
Uh, Ruan, you can activate your microphone, please, and unmute. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, of course there is, because uh, actually year by year we see that some emotion charge vehicles and trolleys <clears throat> are being sold all around Europe. Uh, the point is that at this stage, the trolley bus network, but actually the power supply network is very expensive to I mean, to maintain. I mean, in the end, all those lines and all the power stations that you need uh, all the cleanless and so I mean not even talking about the aesthetical uh, impact that that could be I mean, up to discussion but actually the money is is pretty high so there are a lot of cities mainly uh, there are some of them in Portugal as you said Spain also um, in Czech Republic Switzerland part of France they do have a trolley network, a strong trolley network, and you talk to the operators and they are not willing to take this network out. I mean, the, the thing is that they are not expanding it. So, for example, I don't know, the city of Lyon, which uh, has a very big uh, trolley infrastructure, or in Switzerland, Lausanne is one of uh, the cities with more hills in, in Europe. It has a very long uh, trolling network. What they are doing is, as as far as the city is expanding, uh, if these vehicles need to go to the suburbs, to these new um, suburbs that they are building, there they go on battery. Uh, they, are, they are being powered by the battery. And when they go to the city center, they raise the panto or the lines and they took the um, the pantograph uh, line. So yes, I mean, it is. Now the thing is that the, the, these cities or operators are not investing on expanding it. And do you think it will be necessary to have funds, for example, to support this investment? I don't know. I mean, could be. Uh, it's, a, it's a choice. I mean, in the end, uh, to have a, it's a battery electric vehicle, so for sure they are funded. It's a clean vehicle. They fulfill the clean vehicle directive. So why not? I mean, in the end, is uh, we do not manufacture them, but uh, could be a solution for the for the cities if it makes sense to keep expanding this network. Because again, it's in the end, it's like an e-bus has a charger, a trolley, a trolley bus in Morso Charging or a poor uh, trolley has also an infrastructure behind. I mean, uh, for these cities, it still makes sense economically to to keep it. So I'm I'm not anyone to to discuss about it. Now the, the point is, okay, uh, you are building new suburbs, you are doing... Uh, now, uh, we as a pedestrians love a different kind of view, not all the streets full of rails. The same happens with the trams. Uh, if you go to the rail industry, a lot of trams are putting the lines under the, under the road in order to have a cleaner view. So sometimes it's not about the technical feasibility or the economics, it's, it's more also about the architecture impact. But yeah, why not? I mean, fundings could be, I mean, it's, it's a type of vehicle that has proof itself. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rulen. Uh, Tiago, Jaime, Filipe, do you want to move, step a bit forward? Uh, I think Hulen talked about the main the main the main issues of the trolley bus and the the, the why there we don't see it more in the cities. Uh, the maintenance of the cablings and also uh, visually, it's not so so. Let's say so good to see in the city with the roofs full of cablings, uh, but there are still some some cities in 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 Europe and around the world that uh, have used this type of buses, and there are still some manufacturers that are betting a lot on this on this let's say niche niche market. Thank you, uh, Jaime, uh, Philippe. How can your confederation help, Philippe? How can Omniflow contribute to this topic somehow? Or we can move uh, back to some particular questions to each one yeah. of you. Yeah. Maybe we can move. Yes. Yeah. As a manufacturer, uh, we we I think we can say that uh, it's important the collaboration between uh, not only uh, with governments but with uh, transportation agency, urban planners, other stakeholders, um, to to and it's it, all all of this collaboration is vital to overcome and um, 
some barriers we, we encounter along the, the city lot and create a more sustainable transportation exosystem with our, with our uh, technology. Thank you. Uh, Jaime, I would like to ask you, we have all these, these new sources of energies and power, powers. Uh, I would like to ask you how this change or which adaptations you need to make to fulfill the desire of the customers and also promote a more sustainable bus um, industry and, and the activity. Okay. Well, it's, it's something I, I can say that the, that the Spanish uh, bus and coach sector is, is aware of the importance of keep working, bringing innovation, incorporating concepts and technologies that define the, the experience of the, of the passenger uh, before, during and, and after all the, all the trips. So, so obviously it's, a, it's an important question to, to, to give you an example. Uh, the use of onboard entertainment systems is, is something which is largely present in the in the in the Spanish fleet, and our new innovative technologies have always been incorporated to to respond to the needs of the of the passengers, both for let's say for access to information, for services provided on board. We are talking about Wi-Fi, multimedia, surveillance, uh, individual entertainment on board, and so on. Uh, it's true that uh, well, we are talking to, let's say, uh, alternative fuel uh, vehicles, which uh, have some, some characteristics uh, different. Uh, we talked before about the, the electric buses that, okay, it is clear that for the time being uh, are uh, only being used in the, in the urban environment. Uh, the sector is testing different uh, technologies, uh, hydrogen, uh, electric uh, buses, uh, even biogas. Uh, it's, it's not easy to, to, to choose uh, one particular technology and each technology has different aspects that, that also require the, the operator, the company to, to develop these, these concepts that you, you're asking. Uh, unfortunately, for the time being, uh, when we are talking about uh, regular intercity transport, medium, long distance, also occasional transport and other transport services related to tourism. I'm afraid there is no alternative for the time being to, 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 diesel, to diesel vehicles. Um, that's why, well, even though we are committed to, to sustainable mobility, we have to be realistic with the technologies that we can provide the services with. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know yeah. if that was your uh, question. Yes, I have a quick question. What do you do? What do you do with the batteries when they end their best period of um, of life? Do do you reuse them? Do you um, disassemble them? What do you make with the batteries? I don't know if Jaime is a better question for you, but maybe for Tiago and uh, Julen, maybe they can give you some insights about this topic. Uh, I, I can step in in this. Uh, yes, we we in the if we are talking about the EMS uh, structure, we have reused the batteries for a second life. What we what do we do with these batteries? Uh, we build we make a battery farm, and when the bus operator it's escalating the number of vehicles in their fleet, we use this battery to charge. Um, during the day where the buses are operating and at night when you have the most of the fleet charging in the depot uh, to reduce the, the peak of the grid consumption energy. So we, we call it peak, peak shaving. So when, when you put um, a lot of um, vehicles charging, you have in the grid some peaks of power consumption. And what these batteries do, because they they're, they're, in terms of wage, which is state of health, they are normally below 80 percent they are let's say not useful useful to be transporting because they it's heavy weight um, they are no longer very useful to transport the bus during the day we put it in a battery farm to have uh, to absorb energy during during the day to when the um, the energy grid of the depot requires or demands more uh, capability and more power they compensate this kind of, of energy 
so this what this gives to the operators less less peak consumptions, which is cheaper energy. They can also charge the batteries if they have a fluctuation price during the day, like we have in Portugal. Uh, they can charge this battery farm during the 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 less costly energy price. So um, we we are, have already this implementing in some of our customers. Ruben? Well, actually, we have a, a similar a similar approach here. More or less, we we do all work in the in the same way. There are sometimes that. Um, we purchase the batteries from the from the operator once that they are uh, not good enough for keeping the the transport. Also, that eases the the TCO of the of the operator because in the end they get some some money back when we put the new ones and the old ones uh, are used as uh, Tiago said for peak saving or are used for for other businesses that we might have uh, within the the second life approach. Thank you. Uh, we have been discussing about the short term, short um, short term trips, right? We are discussing about suburban trips, urban uh, trips with buses, but buses are also used for long distance um, journeys. Uh, all these new sources of energy work are compatible with the long distance trips because you need to charge several times during the, the the travel how do you manage this situation which uh, supports do you have right now uh, who wants to step in first about this topic well uh, i hope no go ahead no no sorry go ahead <laughs> okay uh well, this is the again the million dollar question, right? I mean, this this business and this situation is not only for the for the bus operators, long distance bus operators. So, same question for the truck drivers. What do you do with the long distance? Because as I said, right now the battery technology doesn't allow you to run. I know more than 200, 300, and if we want to to travel for 400, 500 kilometers, I mean, could make technologically sense, maybe not economically, but it's very easy. Uh, if we, it is our manufacturer coach, without a place to put the luggage in because it's full of batteries, even if it's very cheap, the operator won't like it because, okay, if I'm taking the tourists to the airport, where do these tourists leave the luggage? So it has no business approach for a coach manufacturer. Then what to do about this uh, new kind of source? Of course, hydrogen has a lot of potential, even if uh, economically speaking, is not very viable yet. They are uh, operators that are, because of course they are strongly backed up economically, uh, they are taking the leap. They are investing on some prototypes of hydrogen coaches. And also as we are doing with the technology, they are also doing it. It's like, okay, Maybe in some years they say hydrogen is going to be a thing. So let's buy one if economically we can afford it. And let's see how it's uh, behave in terms of driving, in terms of safety. Also, as uh, Jaime was saying, it's not only about the driving itself, it's the, the mechanics. You need to train them. Uh, a hydrogen vehicle is like a gas vehicle. Uh, there are a lot of high pressures there, uh, not only in the vehicle, but also the gas uh, refilling station. So all these people need to know a lot about safety and they need to wear special clothes and that makes the price up, up, up and up. So right now there is not a magic formula. We are all uh, with a lot of balls in the air seeing if, okay, it could be hydrogen, could be biodiesel, this uh, new synthetic fuels that uh, they were in the news some, some weeks ago. A lot of potential and time. And do you time. really believe in synthetic? Do you really believe in, the, in that? Um, in that? Because some companies are really trying to uh, develop these solutions. We have uh, projects with uh, Repsol, for example, uh, in Spain, and some other companies are developing that. Uh, it's it's really worth to try it, or 
you don't believe it in yet. I mean, we at TDSR have a very simple approach. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. And we took maybe the riskiest approach, which is, is, okay, let's have the complete portfolio. And then the time will narrow this portfolio by itself. So right now, if you Google irisar.com, you can see all the different powertrains that, that, that we have, and we are going to add more and more. And then if in 10 years, out of those seven, eight, nine different powertrains, we only have three, okay, we have done some investment, we have sold some buses, and now the the kind the type of uh, power change is narrowing by itself so it's not about what we believe we know that at this stage battery is not the future for the long distance and then for the rest we are seeing how the different pieces of the puzzle are getting together okay okay uh tiago or jaime do you want to comment uh yeah, that's that's uh, basically. I'm not sure if Caetano is developing something about long distance uh, buses. They, you are yes. more involved okay. with hydrogen. Yeah, so so for long long distance buses, we, maybe we are talking about uh, FC coaches or or um, coach buses. Uh, we believe that um, electrical and hydrogen will be side by side. There is not, let's say, one only one technology for the future. Mm -hmm. um they will be let's say uh, work um, in the market side by side where electrical will be more focused on the city urban locations and for long distance will be for for hydrogen uh, the big question also here is that will they work with 350 bar or 700 bar uh, because uh, this this type of pressures have a huge impact on the on the um, on the inf our RAS, the, the hydrogen station, um, the, it's a big impact in terms of infrastructure uh, investments. Uh, it's a huge difference in terms of investments. And this is what the government and the public fundings need to, let's say, maybe decide or establish um, a, a clear definition what will be the, 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 the direction of the funds so we can develop, develop the product accordingly. Uh, and yeah, by the way, uh, is it already possible in Portugal to charge a bus with hydrogen or do you still have to buy it to, to Spain? No, uh, it, it is already possible. Actually, we have four vehicles, four Caetano buses operating in Cascais. Um, we have sold to the, to the municipality and they are already op in operation. Uh, so if you are near Cascais, you can for sure uh, 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 feel your Mirai, Toyota Mirai, that we they already have also uh, selling here in Portugal, and Toyota is selling all around the world. Uh, and, and you, you can, can charge there with hydrogen, and the hydrogen is produced in Cascais? Uh, no, the, 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 they, are, they are still not yet producing the hydrogen in Cascais, but there are already uh, f fund fundings, uh, um, let's say, applied and uh, for, for the hydrogen station. They are, they are, let's say, maybe in a year, they will have uh, a station there producing hydrogen with an electrolyzer. And meanwhile, where do you find the hydrogen to charge the, the buses? Uh, I know they, they, they fill the station by trailer, so they have uh, a, a truck that uh, leaves a trailer there from time to time. Uh, but not, to be honest, I don't know where they, they bring the, where, from where they bring the hydrogen, the trailer with the hydrogen. Okay, okay. It, it's, it's also in Cascais that Omni, OmniFlow, I think there you still have a project in Cascais with smart uh, bus stop. Is that, but is that project still rolling or you are expanding? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, OmniFlow really implemented the solution uh, uh, of smart bus stop uh, with the sustainable smart pole uh, in Cascais. Yeah. Uh, and this smart pole and with our unit generates energy through wind and solar, as I said, uh, to feed the light of the bus stop whilst adding also a display with uh, mm -hmm. not only the information about the bus carriers, but also with uh, local and uh, local news and or local information, uh, aiming to approach the city 
uh, to the citizens uh, mostly. So in this case, uh, this is our project in um, in um, in Cascais. Yeah. Okay. We are moving to the third uh, cluster of um, questions. We now we will talk about new customer needs and uh, desires. Um, I would start with uh, Jaime Rodriguez Madal from Confebus. Uh, so uh, the peasant coach has a rather tarnished and old-fashioned image. Um, how an association like Confebus uh, is contributing to a higher attractiveness and perception of the bus and also how is changing the design of the buses to become more inclusive and um, accept different uh, people, like people with disabilities, with less mobility. Uh, how Confibus is working on this topic? Okay, uh, well, I see your, I see your point, uh, but I have to, to, to clarify some, some, some things before. Perhaps that's the general idea worldwide or perhaps across Europe. However, we have to say in this, in this topic that Spain perhaps is a bit different. Uh, why? Because for us in, in, in Spain, the, if we take into account uh, the whole uh, mobility charge when we are talking about collective mobility, we see that the buses and coaches are the most used uh, transport means. Uh, one out of two. Uh, collective uh, trips are done by buses and coaches in Spain. So we have a higher uh, percentage of uh, users uh, in comparison with the, with uh, with other countries. Uh, that's why perhaps we don't have uh, the same uh, image that uh, the buses and coaches have in other countries. To, to give you an example, last time the European Union did a Eurobarometer about buses and coaches, Spain was ranked as the second uh, country uh, most uh, appreciated by the by the passengers. Uh, we were only second uh, because of Ireland got a 1% uh, percentage more of, of uh, user satisfaction. When we say, when we carry out the same service at national level, we see that buses and coaches in Spain uh, are ranked very high, actually very close to high-speed rail. Uh, high-speed rail gets something like 20, sorry, 7.26 points out of 10, and, and Spain's buses uh, get 7.14 out of out of tens, which is which is uh, something close. This is perhaps because in Spain it's it's the buses and coaches that uh, um, move around all the territory. We have a very complicated orography and uh, density of population that has to rely on the on the on buses and coaches to to get everybody, not only the Spanish residents, but also all the millions of tourists that come every year to to Spain and get to know Spain thanks to the to all the network of buses and coaches that we that we have in Spain. But is the coach, sorry to interrupt you, is the coach market finally open in Spain to the, the competitors? The coach market in Spain has been open. The only, the only difference is that it's open through a public uh, uh, competitive tendering process uh, that everybody established in the European Union can participate in the public tenders. That's the, that's the only difference. Ah, you need public tenders to, to be in Spanish markets. Exactly. Mm. Okay. Because in Portugal, it, it runs a bit different from 2019 there. Uh, if you want to uh, establish uh, some routes, you contact the authority, you ask for an authorization, and uh, you can start. Even in sometimes there are some complications with the infrastructure, but step by step, I think they are solving the situation. So Yeah, and in Spain, it is mixed, so that um, in the sense that... Um, each authority is competed on the different transport services. They organize the public tender, and each contract comprises some traffics that perhaps are profitable, and maybe the open market could, could uh, perform them, but they are mixed with some traffics where there is no profitability at, at all. So the bundling of those uh, traffics, those routes, uh, makes that the whole public service contract is enough attractive. To, so we have, uh, let's say, 2,800 uh, companies in Spain uh, fighting for those uh, those tenders, so it's, it makes it very 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 competitive. That's also why perhaps the the number of users of the bus and coach and also the the, the is, is high in comparison with other with other countries and also because uh, the buses and coaches arrive everywhere. So that we have no 
no uh, population area with at least 50 inhabitants, which is not connected by, by a coast, bus, bus or coach line. So, Thank okay, you. Uh, yeah. to your, you know, what I wanted to say is that perhaps the ah. old fashioned image of the bus or, and coach comes from those who do not use the bus and, and, and coach. And, and for us uh, in Confabas, it's, it's important to, to promote, to put into value uh, the activity of the of the industry. So all the activities, all the actions, all the initiatives that we carry out are always uh, thinking of uh, put into value the, the contribution of the industry to the society, to the environment, and, and especially to the to the to the economy. Uh, with the system we have, uh, for instance, uh, in the public tenders, the question that you say regarding accessibility is always uh, tackled, is solved. Uh, in fact, when you, when you look at the studies done by European Commission, they say in terms of people with reduced mobility, assistance such as the Spanish one is the one that makes the authorities uh, to require what type of vehicles and what accessibility conditions are needed so that everybody can go into the, into the bus. Talking about accessibility, Philippe Fernandes from Omniflow, how can your com company contribute to more attractiveness to the buses? and uh, tell to people, hey, we need to use more collective uh, transport means because we need to save our planet. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, we think we can, we can, um, we can help um, by uh, citizen engagement. So uh, creating emphasis on city engagement and participa uh, participa uh, participation of the citizens. Uh, in um, I think city uh, actually evolves uh, residents, businesses, uh, other stakeholders also in decision making process. Um, and yeah, we think city engagement is crucial. Another thing is uh, uh, having a, a, an innovation ecosystem. Okay. Um, by the other hand, uh, we uh, have to be more focused on sustainable mo mobility also. So um, we think in, the, in this case, in this case, um, we, we have also to be in um, part of the, of the change and uh, walk alongside the cities. Uh, like we walk with uh, with Qashqais in in the, um, in the case we talked about, um, and yeah, uh, I can see uh, we have to uh, make part of the vision of the cities, but also um, adding some information, uh, some technology uh, to them, um, and that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tiago and uh, Rulan, uh, before moving to the topic, I would like to ask you if you have any feedback. If you have any feedback from the drivers of the cost of your customers about uh, the experience with bi battery and uh, hydrogen buses, if uh, they really like them, and which improvements are necessary, and which are the main challenges. Uh, yes, so um, the feedback it's good. Uh, we, we at Ketan, of course, we focus very much on the um, on the driver um, on the driver seat, driver space, uh, because they drive the bus for eight or ten hours a day. So uh, we need to keep them comfortable. Um, and and the, also the passengers, but the passengers in a normal city bus, they spend 10 to 15 minutes inside the bus. So it's a very short trip uh, while the driver has a full day of, of work um, in the bus. So since it's all also uh, new technology, new buses, uh, we, we try to implement all the new technology, all the new features inside the bus, like, for example, coolers, uh, a powerful air conditioning, uh, pneumatic seats. Um, so, um, and also uh, in terms of the, um, the smooth of, of the, the, um, the driver condition and the, also the noise. 
because the, the, the bus does not have that combustion engine always working. Um, the driver's feedback, it's a very lean and very, uh, let's say, smooth uh, bus in, in, in comparison to, to, to diesel buses. So the, the feedback normally it's good. And we are also implementing some new technologies like CMS, which is the replacement of external uh, mirrors mechanical mirrors for cameras so uh, this kind of uh, new technologies uh, are very welcome from the drivers and and of course they they enjoy uh, i think like and do every... they know mm -hmm. and sorry and do they know that sometimes it's enough to lift and coast instead of uh braking to reduce the speed uh, so, sorry, can you repeat? I didn't understand. Do, do, do you think the drivers know that sometimes is enough to lift and coast instead of braking to reduce the speed of the buses, of the vehicle? Yes, that, that's some, all, some, some part of, of the challenge that we have when we deliver a new bus. Uh, electrical or hydrogen bus, it's to um, show and teach the drivers how to, to behave. Uh, but there are some operators that have some marks uh, to challenge the drivers among themselves, which is the, the, small, the, 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 the driver of the month who has less consumption of the bus. So this is, this is quite funny for them because they, they among themselves, they, they create some kind of uh, com competitive uh, situation about who is the less consumption driver, uh, and 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 they they automatically start working with the, uh, differently from a diesel bus when when it comes to electrical electrical uh, vehicle. Yes, and Roland, what are your, your insights about this topic? Well, actually, <clears throat> the very same as as they was saying in the end, the driver is. In the case of a city bus, is the the one that spends most of the time, more of the time uh, during the the work of the vehicle. So uh, everyone we need to to keep them comfortable. The actually the, the experience I have from different drivers is that they they do like it because it's so silent, and also it's a very very funny thing that actually an electric motor, despite the technology, has the the seconds in order to get the torque working is way more quick than the diesel engine. So in the end, an e-bus gets out of the stop faster than a diesel bus. So they like this feel of fast and furious speed. And uh, <laughs> it's very it's very well appreciated from the from the drivers actually. Okay, okay. This Vin Diesel moment. And uh not diesel about... in this case. But yes, yeah, it's a, it's yeah, a yeah battery literally. or something. But yeah, <laughs> that was a very good one, uh, Julian. Um, there is also, uh, also another question from the audience. I will take right away. It's uh, very interesting about this topic. Uh, do you, did you ever discuss about retrofitting the the current diesel buses and convert them into electric or fuel cell buses? Is that possible in technical terms? Or you need a completely new platform uh, to install batteries uh, and fuel cell components. Okay, uh, I will take this one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is there is a business ongoing. I mean, there are several companies all around Europe that do this kind this kind of things. Uh, we as even in is, Spain. Or to be honest, I don't know if in Spain there could be. I mean, I'm not saying no. Uh, I know. Maybe a Jaime of can help us on this. Uh, <laughs> They exist actually. One of the uh, funding mechanisms uh, that Spain has in the next generation funds for operators is the retrofitting of, of uh, diesel uh, coaches into electric uh, or hydrogen ones. But I, I have to say the, the, that part of the, of the funding mechanism is not, has, been, you know, it has not been very uh, successful uh, because the one problem is that when even technical, technically speaking, about uh, out of that. Is that once you do the retrofit, the um, bus of the vehicle still has or is the same age, which is for public service contract is important because uh, you need to maintain a certain average and a maximum age of fleet that you have to use. And I have to say, politicians do not want old buses, they want the new ones. And um, Rulen, I don't know if you want to complete your answer or if we, or if we can move to Tiago. Tiago. 
Yes, so uh, actually regarding retrofit, we are already doing it in, in airport buses. Um, we have this, this already ongoing and we have several projects from, from for the transformation. Regarding uh, city buses, uh, it's more complicated, uh, at least here in Portugal, uh, because the regulation is not adapted to, to that and it's a, a bureaucracy nightmare. Um, I, I know of some some operators that have tried to, to do that, and for in terms of legalization and registration of the vehicle, since the the the, the local authority it's not prepared to to this kind of retrofit, so it's 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 really a nightmare. So uh, if we want to do this, I think the companies and some companies are already prepared to do this, but it's necessary are also for the authorities. Um, to be uh, prepared for for these legal uh, uh, adjustments. So th this is the main, let's say, uh, roadblock that we have found uh, at the moment, at least here in Portugal. Thank you very much. So we are moving towards the last stop of this debate. So we will ask about the vision for 2030 and above. And I would like to introduce this topic by adding this concept, context that in Portugal and in Spain, there we can witness the start of the bus rapid transit solutions. I know, for example, in Madrid, it just started a, pro a project regarding this uh, kind of vehicle. In Portugal, we have at least two new projects coming, one to Coimbra and another to, to Porto. And I would like to understand how this kind of uh, vehicles is compatible to the ecosystem of transportation and uh, why in your perception they can replace heavier solutions or rail solutions what is your perception about this i don't know if Jaime you can contribute i'm quite sure that Rulen and Tiago can uh, have some insights about this who wants to start Okay, I take the lead. Don't be afraid. <laughs> okay, Julian, I mean, yes. yes. Your turn. In, in our case, uh, we have several BRT projects ongoing. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, we are the, the, the bus manufacturers in this BRT system in, in Madrid. We have several systems in, in France, also in uh, and other parts of Spain, like in Vitoria. The BRT is, uh, is a concept that was born in Latin America long ago i mean there was the the latin american version to the trams let's put it in a very silly words uh, but it works i mean uh, there are a lot of cities in latin america that work with prt in the end brt is just to put a separate line a bus and then uh, the bus can work on diesel hydrogen uh, it could be a trolley electric so it doesn't matter now we are taking this solution to europe in order to put it in place where, economically speaking, the tram doesn't make sense. doesn't make sense because maybe you are not going to move so many people as the tram will because the, you, don't, you don't, as a city, uh, for this line, will have the, the demand or because you don't have the money to make the investment. Of course, I mean, in the end, a, a rail vehicle is, is quite expensive. Also, uh, you need to put the, the catenary, you need to build the rail. So a bus is, is less expensive and you only need to build on concrete. Then you can get as fancy as you want, architecturally speaking. But it's um, it's a, it's a quite a good solution. And also it allows you at this goes in a separate line, usually with a, a separate uh, traffic light priority to get very, very nice frequency of buses, like every two minutes, every three minutes, because in the end, it's not like a train that you need to take the safety concept more, more seriously. So for us, it's a, it's a good solution. It's a solution that needs to be taken into account. For example, in the UITP, uh, the, the UITP is funding, well, it's leaving, not funding. The funds come from the European Commission, a project called EBRT, where more than 40 partners, different manufacturers, different cities are putting as a demonstrator different BRT systems all over Europe. In uh, TMB, the operator of Barcelona, is, is part of it. And the goal is to prove that the BRT systems work. They can, I mean, uh, need to be pushed. And also the a little bit the, the, the value added is how they can be more automatized in order to make it more efficient, safe, and 
frequent in time. And how much time does it last uh, a bus rapid transit vehicle? Well, it depends on a lot of on a lot of things. It depends on uh, this in separate. Average, in, average. in average, usually should be uh, the commercial speed should be beyond 16, 18 kilometers per hour. No, 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 you... no, no. Sorry, and that's not, that was not my question. My question is, how much time does it last in terms of years? The oh, vehicle. Uh, the vehicle, 15, 16. Okay. Uh, Tiago. I know Caetano uh, Buzz is also approaching this uh, idea. I don't know if you can give us some insights about this topic. Yes. So, so um, like Julian said, VRT it's 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 um, it's um, part of the mobility in, in the in the cities. And if you want to have uh, steadable schedules. And every two minutes, a bus passing by, you need a dedicated route for for for, for it. Um, what what does the BRT allow is uh, the cities uh, that do not have some uh, let's say limitations or constraints about uh, private um, cars in inside the cities. Uh, the routes are. Each every year, they, they there are more cars in the in in the road. So if you put more cars in the road and even more buses, then you have uh, uh, accessibility and schedule um, issues. So the BRT allows to have uh, let's say a dedicated routes, no no traffic, um, and the, and the the persons can move freely inside these areas uh, by removing the bus. From the streets, there are more spaces for cars, or even more more spaces for pedestrians. So it's it's let's say a very good solution for someone to move from point A to point B uh, without have to use your, its own uh, private vehicle. Um, and in terms of infrastructure, it's cheaper than 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 trams or even metro subways. So it's it's a cheaper and easiest solutions for cities that already have their infrastructure built and uh, let's say municipalities have to adapt and adjust the mobility of its um, users um, with already uh, infrastructures so yeah that's, uh, that's pretty much it Reim and uh, Philippe uh, we would like to end all of you by the way um, in two or three minutes, which are your visions for 2030 and above in terms of the bus ecosystem in Europe and specifically in Portugal and Spain, depending on where yeah. you are, of course? Yeah, of course. Um, I can, uh, as, uh, as I said before, as a, as a manufacturer, um, I can outline two potential um, key aspects that may be part of the vision for 2030 uh, buzz mobility. Uh, the first one is um, the renewable energy integration. Uh, we're saying that uh, charging infrastructure must be connected to renewable energy grids, such, such as solar and wind, um, to ensure that the energy used on the charge uh, uh, electric buses is sourced and sustainable uh, and this integration would further reduce the carbon footprint associated with public transportation this did um, this is the the first one um, and the second one is uh, intelligence uh, in intelligence and um, connected systems um, so advanced technologies such a, such a, for example real time uh, data analytics or artificial intelligence or uh, IoT devices must be um, utilized to omni optimize bus operations and imp or, for example, improve route planning or also uh, enhance passenger experiences. Uh, but most of all, it is important to note that uh, that the realization of these goals um, will depend uh, on some factors, um, policy frameworks, uh, technological advancements, funding availability, and uh, and also public support. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, maybe Raim. Yes. Okay. So so. 
for, for me, vision 2030, I, uh, I would say that mobility in general terms is, is gaining a, a very high uh, momentum in, both in, in private investments and also in, in, in terms of political and public uh, agendas. We have not to forget that mobility is, is something real and it's a very an essential, an essential need. Uh, we are seeing lots of policies, lots of initiatives to, in order to improve uh, people's quality of life and in order to improve uh, people's quality of life, uh, this leads to more transport services and uh, more demand of mobility services, but not, not any kind of, of mobility. Uh, mobility, as we are seeing, will have to be um, effective, responsible, um, effective and obviously uh, sustainable. We are seeing, we are living in a world which is becoming more digital and more globalized. And for transport by bus and coach to, to achieve those objectives, we will clearly need more, more, more push and also more uh, political, political support. But we have to consider that uh, buses and coaches are the, um, the key bone of the sustainable mobility. They will be a, a strong uh, actor in order to transform the, the transition to the greening of the road transport industry. Um, in the end, we have, we have to be frank. Uh, we are talking all, about a lot of mobility, transport services, future of mobility. Now everything is mobility, but we have to be realistic. Uh, the only transport mode which is um, efficient in a social, environmental, and economic point of view to move uh, largest groups of people around in a very cost-effective manner are buses and coaches. Okay, thank you for your insight, Jaime. Uh, Tiago or Rulen, who would like to speak now? Don't okay, be afraid. Uh, yes, no, at this stage. Uh, I mean, for us, uh, 2030, 20 is, it's not easy, but uh, 2030 for us is going to be way more digital. Until now, bus and coach business has been a very analogic and um, mean of transport. And now, we all have realized that data is uh, is the power. So we as I mean, we ourselves as cities are seeing how, of course, city operators and also public operators are asking more and more data, data in the cloud, cybersecurity. So uh, we are becoming small trains on wheels. So for us, uh, the 2030 is going to be more digital, way more connected. Of course, uh, cleaner. We will see if it's going to be battery fuel cell or whatsoever. Um, maybe it could be that the how we are moving today needs to change. If we want to get to a cleaner to a cleaner world, uh, we need to change the the way we see the the mobility. Take our car in the garage, and if we need to make a long distance, uh, as as Jaime said. Maybe from big city to big city, the train is uh, is quicker and comfortable, but uh, that's not the reality for 80% of the of the journeys the day by day. And in the end, the, the bus and coach is a flexible system. It's a flexible system that also allows you to have the smallest frequencies, and that's the the biggest added value of uh, of this sector. Thank you, Ruben, Tiago. Um, yeah, so I think every everything was pretty much said. Um, um, the the future is digital. Uh, currently, K Tenables we are already fully, let's say, monitoring remotely monitoring the the zero emission buses. So we are collecting data. We we are creating our database that will allow us to go even further and understand how we can evaluate our buses and the technology that we are using. Uh, also, the European regulation will change in 2024. Uh, there will be some quite demands about um, the, the, what we need to implement in the buses in terms of cyber security and also uh, security for the passengers and for, for the, the pedestrians. Uh, so we are moving, uh, we are moving fast. Um, and if we want, let's say, to see more buses and clear, clear, clean air in the cities, uh, I think we have all to work on, on, on that on that direction, and the, the bus um, system has to be more fast, more uh, let's say reliable, and uh, of course the, the the municipalities also need to to let's say let the users 
um, have capability to use the public transport systems, and they have to show it. They are they are they are feasible and uh, reliable. Uh, option to go from point A to point B without using our personal vehicles uh, that create uh, more constraints in, in the cities and, um, and operates uh, throughout the, the cities from, from, from everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have no more questions from the audience, at least we haven't received any further questions over the last uh, minutes? So I don't know. Uh, maybe we can uh, get this debate into a conclusion. So maybe I can uh, move my um, my microphone, my virtual microphone, maybe to Sylvia or to Annalisa to conclude this session. Thank you very much all for your time. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, it has been a super interesting debate. I'm uh, flashed about how much there is to talk about and it will be. No, um, I think uh, this uh, sector is very lucky. <laughs> uh, you will still have a lot to do in the next year. I think you all, uh, we all see there are a lot to do. And um, and it's uh, a lot being done. I was really, uh, well, I'm very thankful for you to be all, that you all be here, that you were all here. And um, I hope you have enjoyed, everybody has enjoyed the platform we have given uh, today, a different platform that is normally being used from a trade show side. But um, it is indeed important to talk about uh, the different situations in different countries. So thank you again for being here. And um, yeah, I'm really happy uh, that we could uh, have uh, some such important speakers from Spain and also from Portugal, but I will leave that for Annalisa. Um, yeah, just uh, great uh, having you here. And I hope everybody had uh, the same uh, impression that I had. I was very grateful. Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. I'm. Uh, I just can underline your your words and uh, thank you for um, the interesting discussion and especially to our panelists for um, your time and giving us um, so many interesting insights about um, the future of mobility and the the sustainable bus mobility. Um, yeah. Um, to Spain and to our Portuguese participants and live stream viewers also uh, thank you for um, showing interest and uh, for um, viewing our live stream today and I just hope that we all see each other next year in Berlin at uh, bus to bus and um, I will just ask you um, to uh, stay uh, with us for just another minute and watch um, our Bus to Bus movie so that you can see what to expect uh, next year uh, in Berlin. Um, from my side, obrigada, thank you and uh, have a nice day.